right, welcome back to another episode of Friends from Work. Robbie was wearing a tank top right before we turned this on and put a shirt on <laughs> over top of it. So unfortunately for all you people out there, you don't get to see him like I saw him, which is an absolute <laughs> shame. Just jacked out of his mind, hair flowing, black tank top. It was literally not safe for work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I you know wanted. that is my that's what everyone always thinks of when they think of me <laughs> is just jacked out of his mind well, that is the so skinny that the muscles are visible <laughs> yes congratulations are in order first of all congratulations to friend of the pod we wish robert downey jr on his oh, man, oscar yeah. victory yep he won best supporting actor robbie did the oscars fulfill your dreams your hopes and dreams. Like I said, it's like your Super Bowl. So break it down. Yeah, for me. man, they, they totally did. I, I feel like, uh, well, one, I have to, I have to, while we're talking about congratulations, I have to show this guy because what? I took the, uh, so every year at the Oscar party, we, we like fill out our own ballots and, oh, I get it. uh, whoever wins gets their own, uh, Oscar and, uh, I, I, I took this year's. So I had a, and in part because I, I did not just go like, I I didn't go all in on Oppenheimer. I actually think some of the things you and I talked about in some of our screensaver episodes, like I, yeah, like I, I, I think I went for poor things for costume and production design. And I think they won both of those categories just in general. Like, so I, I guess this is an indication of like the, the movies that I thought should win pretty much did mm-hmm. across the board. And it's funny, like I noticed the headlines the next day uh, were so boring because there wasn't any controversial, like there was no slap <laughs> or anything like to but to unpack. In all was, world, I'm just Ken performance. I mean, if oh you, my gosh. Did you, you watched it? I didn't watch the Oscars, but I saw the I'm Just Ken performance. I was blown away on so many levels. First of all, it's hilarious. Incredible. Second of all, I had no idea he's actually that good at singing and performing. Like, he has as much charisma as any performer. Dude, he's so funny. He's it's so like, funny. I've been saying this for a year. I want him on the MCU side of things. Yeah. He's I mean, even so just like, naturally funny to me. The moment where he was like going from Greta Gerwig to Margot Robbie to Emma Stone and having them sing along, and it was just like, or you're just right, how he, he started so, right behind Margot Robbie staring with the, at her. Like, <laughs> I and then I, I loved so, I loved how he treated all the male band members. Like he would like uh-huh. hold their hand as he walks by them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch his bit with uh, Emily Blunt? Uh, yes, where they're joking about. We're past it. I, We're not making fun. I of also it. thought that was really funny. Uh dude, he's just like, natural. He he goes all in on everything. Have you ever seen yeah. Ni- the knife guys with Will Ferrell on, on Jimmy Kimmel's show? No. They, he and oh, dude, please Google it after this. He and Will Ferrell okay. sell knives on Jimmy Kimmel's. <laughs> like it's That's, a recurring bit, but he goes all in. He's the knife well, guy. <laughs> I will say, like, I do not uh, you know, I, I really love SNL as a kind of an institution. I go through phases of watching it more and less regularly but we always watch at least a few episodes a season I feel like sure depending on who's hosting I still think that the and this is like a this is a a hard recommendation for anybody that's listening that has Hulu or whatever Peacock I guess is what SNL's on now don't ask me but like this the season premiere from like 2018 or something was Ryan Gosling Okay. And it is still one of the funniest episodes of that show I have ever seen mm. because he like, obviously, I mean, the host adds to to what sketches get written and all that. But I also think that just his, the role that he plays, you've probably seen some of those sketches, like the papyrus mm-hmm. video oh, oh, short yeah, of course, about of course. Avatar. Like that's all from that one. Okay. Man, it's so good. Who but, could he play in the MCU? Like, Killian Murphy for Dr. Doom, mm. for sure. Yep. I'm all on board with that. Who could Ryan Gosling play? What's a character we don't have yet where it could have that Han Solo slick, but really funny? I, I mean, he, he would like, be like a Star-Lord. Would be a perfect example of what he could be, but now it's already cast. You know what I mean? That's kind of the vibe yeah, I'm yeah. thinking. Yeah. No, I feel like, uh, well, I think Candace and I talked about um, when we were reading the the Matt Fraction Hawkeye stuff. He could be Hawkeye. 
I, I think the version of Hawkeye in the comics, sure. like that isn't, you know, but I'm saying we've from now about, on, it's too late. He's not doing that. Yeah, but yeah, if you yeah. were to join, um, is there anybody left? Well, I feel like people have talked about Ghost Rider, but I don't, I, I think that like, it's too that's intense. too, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I could see, like, I mean, if, he kind of, he, he kind of does it in Blade Runner, the like tough vibe, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, he could pull it off for sure. Uh, but I, but I, I just but I would, think that, it'd be a shame to not have him in a slightly lighter role, you know, like something a little looser. I, mean, I think he would actually, again, this is because we just had cast it. So it's not, not fair game, but like the human torch is the first character that came to mind for me. Yeah. Um, I said looser. I meant Lucy goosey or looser, not looser. <laughs> I, uh, let me think I about think, it. I'll get back to you. Probably like on the, you know, I, I think that there are some options on the X-Men side of things, which will actually transition us yeah. well. Hold on, hold uh, on. But, Don't transition us. Don't transition us. <laughs> but before we actually, before we transition us, uh, I did want to also say, man, talking about sheer charisma, it is, it's so fascinating to me to watch all of these famous, beautiful people in a room together that are all like their job is to be in front of a camera and be charismatic. And how even in that context, RDJ is like, like shining like way beyond like almost anybody else. Gosling is like another example of that. Like it's so interesting seeing people like even um, it's like whenever, uh, I don't know, it's like an NBA player or something where like oh, yes. obviously Sports metaphor, please go like if they're if they're like just going to play pick up with a random person, they they look incredible by comparison, but then you've got like the Michael Jordans that look incredible by comparison to other NBA players. Sure. And it's like, that was the, it's just like, I, I've watched a lot of his award speeches uh, through the, the whole Oppenheimer run. And like, did you watch his Golden Globes? I did. Uh, and I watched his Oscars one. Yes. Where he's like, I know what you're thinking. You know, why does everything seem to be going my way? It's just like he's so quick and funny and charming and like it just I, I was I loved watching him the whole night. He was so excited for everybody else. It was just like, man, he is just the king. It was really, really fun to see him get recognized. Obviously. Uh, and Killian. Yeah, I think there were two people in particular that we were excited to see victorious. Robert, just because he needed to get one. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've had the discussion about, you know, could he have been nominated for something from Endgame or Civil War? We think so, but he didn't, mm -hmm. but at least he got one now. And then the other one is obviously Christopher Nolan, because it's an absolute yeah. travesty that he had not won Best Director or Best Picture yet. And he did. He won well, both. So and he was he was such the star of the night, you know, like everybody that that won for Oppenheimer. He took the very professional high road in his speech. Didn't bash yeah. anyone. I think it really actually means something to him. He said that last line of now I finally, or I won one and this will like, now I'm honored to be a part of film history forever a little bit or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, he's, he thinks it's a big deal to get this. The thing Nolan said that stuck with me was talking about how like we're only a hundred years into yeah. film yeah, good point. as a, as an art form. And he was saying, you know, compare that to, being a hundred years into theater or art, you know, and, and how, like how far those things have come since then. And so I thought that that was like a, an inspiring, mm -hmm. yeah, it, 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 it was, it was perfect. I thought the, the other thing that I really loved that I don't know that we really got to talk about in our Oppenheimer episode, uh, cause it hadn't really clicked for me, but obviously Killian Murphy has, been in every major Nolan movie since what Batman Begins. Yeah, I think and it's five or maybe six. This is his Interstellar. Sixth was he an in Interstellar? This is his sixth project, was. I think. Not Interstellar. Um, yes, Dunkirk. Yes. Dark oh, and I guess Knight, he wasn't in Tenet was... either. He's been in. He's this been is, in a lot. This is his sixth. I think he said. Yeah. I, I think what I love is that of all of the movies Nolan has made that are. I mean, he's made so many great movies with like mega lead actors, like even Leo and in Inception uh, or McConaughey. I mean, I think that that was right, either right before or right after he won Best Actor. But I love that uh, it is Killian who has been kind of this like background actor that kind of takes the the lead 
in the first Nolan movie that gets this level of recognition. Like, not because Leo didn't sure. deserve it or anything like that. I just think it's really cool given how much, like, there's there have been a lot of pieces about Killian just being this kind of like actor's actor that's been yeah just consistently churning out great work for decades. And so it's really cool to see. And the exact opposite personality of Robert Downey Jr. So introverted. Yeah. Like, hates the yeah. spotlight. <laughs> it's amazing. If you watch any interviews, I've watched a lot. Mm-hmm. Robert brings out a fun side of him because... <laughs> He is so quiet. Like if they do a uh, like a late night show with Robert, Emily, and Killian, he won't say anything uh-huh. unless directly asked. <laughs> I mean, my understanding is, I think part of the reason he he probably gets on with Nolan so well is I think they're both pretty off the grid as yeah. creators. Like I think that this is the most, which makes sense. Like this is the most Killian has ever been brought into the spotlight, and so I think that. You know, they're, you're getting all the, like, thirst trap GQ photo shoots mm-hmm. and everything. But I think that <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, uh, like, I think he's normally just living, like, a very normal dad life. And, uh, one, I, I love the stories about how dedicated he was on set. Mm-hmm. Because I know that, like, like, Robert's talked about how he would never come out to dinner with them because <laughs> he was... One, like having to learn, you know, a whole chunk of the script in Dutch, but then also having to, he was always trying to lose weight so that he could look more like Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. And so he just would never go to dinner. He would just like, it was always trying to eat less food to look more emaciated. That in and of itself is never that impressive to me unless it is... Like, I think Jared Leto is, is the kind of actor that like does things like that, but I just don't feel like there's anything to show for it (laughs) like it's like okay you wow like you went through all of morbius in like you know walking on crutches and and using a wheelchair and morbius like (laughs) like i don't think anybody came away thinking that that dedication paid off but i like that like killian did like to go through that to slowly like pay your dues and then to just get that kind of recognition i i was just in general I was really excited because for so long, like I, I was so afraid, I guess, that it was going to be a, a, a moment like uh, Angela Bassett in last year's Oscars where it's like, man, like I, I'm, I love everything everywhere. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. That really feels like the wrong call. Oh yeah. I and forgot and about I'm that. a bummer. That is that's a, a massive wrong call. That movie is so good, but Jamie Lee Curtis is, is, Good thing number 30 in that movie. And it's not her fault. It's no. just the nature of no. the She's of hardly the role. even in it. But I mean, we just watched Wakanda Forever, and I, I just kept thinking, like, holy cow, man. Yeah, Angela sure. Bassett is just out of this world. And so I I think the only... Ludwig Gordonson is the, the other one that I was going to be really bummed he if won. he didn't get recognition. His second time now? Yeah. And, uh, which is crazy, because he's, like, so young, relatively... But uh, seven total I, awards for Oppenheimer. Yeah, I was I, I was trying to think. I'm pretty sure, unless you know, it was an award that was off screen that I missed. I don't think Killers got anything. Killers of the Flower Moon didn't. I, I'm debating if I should say this. Oh, I'm just real. I'm really starting to. <laughs> I'm really start. Martin Scorsese is starting to get on my nerves. I, I was going back through his filmography, and I, you know, I said in that episode, I, I really like his movies. I don't know if I really do like his movies in general. And wow. then he's becoming kind of obnoxiously loud. You know, he's the, he's the anti Marvel guy, which I can okay, I can deal with a little bit, but right. he just says some stuff that I'm like, I, don't, I just I don't know. I think he's losing touch. So uh, apparently, I think I read this right that he's never won actually Best Picture either. He's like over 12 or over 13. Either way, it's something like that. I know he's won best. I think he won best director for Departed. He's uh, he's, never best picture. Never won best picture. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. He tweeted or said something in this article where he said, um, if Killers of the Flower Moon doesn't win anything, I'm going to go make a stupid bad movie out of revenge. I, I just, it comes off to me like, oh, my movies are so good and so elevated that if I don't right. win one, I'll be shocked. 
And I, I watched it. I'm like, it's a good movie, but I'm fine with you not winning one. I don't know. I just, me and him, yeah. we're growing further and further apart. <laughs> I do not like his opinions, and I'm starting to like his movies less because of it. I'm sorry. That's hot yeah, take. Yeah. But it's getting on my nerves. It's like, dude, that's that comes off as like really egotistical, especially to something that I feel like doesn't deserve the hate in Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't Yeah. Like, I don't know if he was no. implying, like, well, I'll go make a, a blockbuster instead. You know, it's like, come on, dude. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it's so it's, elevated over all of us. Wow. Congrats. There are other, it, to me, I, I think I was going to be disappointed if, if I, I never thought that Killers was going to win unless it was some kind of just nod to his career in general. Like we kind of talked about, no. maybe that was factoring in. I thought RDJ Lily could too. win or some kind of like I, costumes or something. So I think my big, yeah, I was kind of surprised that Lily didn't win. I was really, I was happy for Emma Stone. I, I have not seen uh, what the reaction was to that, but I, she I think genuinely that, surprised. Yeah, I mean, which was really, which was also charming, and you know, like if something, uh, like I, she did, I, re- she did I related to the to three year old bit. What oh, you think, right. the child? Hundred percent. Yeah, okay, I, we got to uh, move on. This is an X Men episode. Holy cow! Twenty minutes in, now oh, I know. Now I, I know. Call it Oscars oh. and X Men. I know. Although we did have on the schedule originally an Oscar uh, <laughs> yeah, debrief. Yeah. I I, the last yeah. thing I was going to say, I think I got to give it to my you. only the only things. I guess there were three categories that I I think. I guess maybe two that could have gone the other way because I'm happy for Emma having won. I I was going to be excited to see Lily Gladstone win that, but um, one I. I'm not upset about it because Zone of Interest did some really great things with sound. That is the one category oh, Oppenheimer yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't get that I think it probably should have. And that was the one category I said it was going to win in my initial review. Whoops. Oh, right. But I mean, still, you know, one score. The other thing for me was uh, a movie we didn't, two movies we didn't really talk about, but um, Anatomy of a Fall won best uh, original screenplay, I think. And... That movie was great and really interesting as a lawyer because it's all about like the French legal system and this murder trial. But uh, I was I was gunning for past lives there to win the best uh, original screenplay. And I say that here in closing because that is one of the movies that if we had had more time, I was really excited for you to watch because I think you would uh, really enjoy that one. Okay. As kind of like a like a sort of I like kind st- of in the la la land vein i can still watch it even if i don't talk about it here on this podcast so no exactly that's why it's like we're it's it's always oscar season <laughs> at friends from work at the, at the earl household at the earl <laughs> sanctum it is will we see dune part two here at all next year maybe i have an audio engineer friend who never talks to me about movies not a huge movie guy i got a text last night 11 30 p.m i didn't see it till this morning that he had just walked out of the theater and was blown away by Dune and said, I can't get over how good it sounded and looked. And I said, dude, that's exactly what I said. It's the probably the best looking and sounding movie. He was all the way in the weeds of like, they had to have done all ADR with the dialogue because it was so cleanly mixed. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, but he was all, <laughs> but see, like that is the takeaway even from like nerds. It's, it's uh, from audio yeah. nerds. It sounded that's so fun. good. Uh, anyways, before X-Men, my last congratulations as a follow-up to a week and a half ago. Congratulations to friend of the pod, Kirk Cousins, on oh, a yes. brand new contract. It's just staggering. Yes, he already has a lot of money, but anytime you put pen to paper and when you put your name on a piece of paper, you're going to get a $50 million signing bonus with another $50 million guaranteed regardless of what happens with the potential of it being up to $180 million more. I need people to put that in perspective. He's our age. Yeah. He, he's not He's not like a, a, a wealthy billionaire CEO that's 60 years old. He is my age, and he's getting another $50 million check. That's not. It's all about the money. I'm just saying from, from my perspective, right. that part is so mind-blowing to me. So we it's talked so to crazy. him right before, like while these decisions were kind of getting worked out. He's going to the Atlanta Falcons. So I have so many mixed emotions, by the way, like, I know he mm-hmm. does too. Like a lot of sadness to be leaving Minnesota. So if any Vikings fans are listening, know that I'm still kind of in the grieving process, but I'm going to be eventually so, 
stoked about Atlanta. For me, he's going to be now be three and a half hours from me, which is so cool. So just seeing him a yeah. lot more, but also going to a ton of games. Um, it, the Falcons are more a part of the culture down here, obviously, than the right. Vikings are. So, and I, I, he's really stoked on the opportunity. Like he's had some unbelievably special conversations with people from Atlanta. They really believe in him, which I think it, it feels good to be believed in. And then his in-laws already live there. So he's kind of going to a house that he already owns and mm -hmm. uh, right by his wife's family and his wife's brothers are close friends of his too. So like, it's going to be a pretty natural transition, but anyways, congrats to him. $180 yeah. million dollars richer since the last time we talked, to, <laughs> talked to him on this podcast, man. I remember the first time I got $180 million. Yeah. I mean, it's unfathomable, yeah. but uh, also so well-deserved. I feel like just given the yeah. kind of person he is and the career he's had, I mean, talking about people that put in the, the work and the time. And obviously he's been a big deal quarterback for a while, but I also know that there were times where he didn't seem to be getting his due. So yeah. Yeah. Good point. Fun, fun to see fun, uh, fun week for all of the folks that we, uh, root for at friends. For That's work. right. That's right. Including me getting to see you in a tank top. So thank you for that. Including, um, including <laughs> X-Men 97 is on our doorstep. And we're going to give you a quick primer to get your minds right after a quick word from these sponsors. And by the way, check out nerdriot.shop and use the promo code friends from work if you want to check out some X-Men stuff. They have some cool X-Men stuff on there. Yeah, uh, Robbie, here's the thing. I think this is how we should approach this because it's true. And I think there will be a lot of people in our audience like me, which is mm -hmm. I truly have no idea what I'm about to watch this week. What do I need to know about this? I have some specific questions, but I think just inform an audience that doesn't know anything about it. Talk to me as if I'm five years old and tell me what I'm about to see. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I think first off, it's just important to recognize, because I don't know that we've really delved into this, certainly on the main feed, how monumental this show was in, in so many ways. Like, to, to start, well, even just there, so, so this is a continuation of the show of our childhood from 97. Yeah. So that's the, so I guess, I guess the first place for people that maybe didn't grow up there or, or people grow up with the show or people that, uh, you know, just haven't thought about it since the nineties, which is fair. This is supposed to be just the next season essentially in the X-Men animated series that ran throughout the nineties. Mm. Uh, they are bringing back, I think as many voice cast members as they can, as are available like I know that uh, there are a couple of of new folks in the cast, although okay. even the new folks are kind of voice acting legends uh, within that community. But like, I think the the big headlines we have the the same voice actors returning for Beast, who I think is kind of one of the more iconic characters from that show. Wolverine, obviously, Storm. I, I guess two things, just as kind of a starting point. One, this really did introduce an entire generation, like our generation, really, uh, to the X-Men, but also to Marvel stuff. You know, we've talked about yeah. how Marvel almost went bankrupt in the 90s and and all of the, like, all the reasons why Iron Man shouldn't have ever happened. Mm -hmm. The one thing that was kind of keeping Marvel afloat through this period was the the X-Men stuff and and this show really took that from a primarily comics audience to like a, a household name and became and this aired once massive. a week once a week on Saturday mornings is that correct yeah I think so I think sometimes they would do double double feature episodes like two parters okay. but I think generally it was uh once a week you know during the season but, and this was pre or post Spider-Man animated shows. So 
this was pre the 90s Spider-Man animated show, which I've talked about as kind of my entry point, but only by like a year. Uh, it, that's why this really did kick off. Like some people say that the the Marvel cartoon universe that existed in the 90s was a prototype for the MCU in that they introduced the X-Men property, which was really successful. The Spider-Man show was really successful. They also had like with varying success, but I still think a decent amount of viewership, like Iron Man, Fantastic Four shows. They had a Silver Surfer show and it was all running on this Fox Kids uh, like morning, Saturday morning slot. Okay. X-Men was to that era, you know, what Iron Man was to mm -hmm. to ours in terms of just Well, kind like of I was even Marvel aware of it. Did. Without seeing it ever, I was aware of the fact that it was happening. So. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and one thing that I think is kind of unique about this show compared to something like uh, like Batman, the animated series, which was the other big cartoon juggernaut, at least on the kid's side of this era, like that show is pretty episodic. Like the way that it, it works is like you have a, I don't know if you watched any of that growing up much. I don't, I don't think you did. I think we talked about no, that, but yeah. the nice thing about that show is you turn it on and you don't really have to know anything else. Like every episode is fairly self-contained. They don't give every villain an origin story. Like some villains, they just assume you're kind of aware of as like someone that knows Batman lore. And so it's like, whatever is playing, that's kind of its own thing. X-Men really kicked off the like long running stories, like a whole season long okay. arc where it's like, well, maybe every episode is kind of unique, but at the beginning and end of every episode, you're checking in on this ongoing thing with Xavier and Magneto. And it's like, that, I think, is also pretty significant uh, from an MCU mm. perspective because it's laying the groundwork for everything is connected, everything has payoff, and then they did start, like, eventually merging, like, having guest appearances from Spider-Man, sure. from other, and so yeah, it was... I can, uh, I can see how that'd be a big deal back then. Did yeah. the show start in 97 or finish in 97? So I think the idea is this is the season that would have been in 97. I think it finished oh, in 96. Oh, so it finished in 96. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, the other so thing I was going to... So X-Men 97 is a new name. The 97 yes. is a new thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was originally just X-Men, the animated series. Did any of these characters... Were they supposed to have made the trip over to the X-Men 2000 series? Like when you saw Professor X in the live action X-Men 2000, uh -huh. is there any carryover from the Professor X from this show? Or are there two totally separate things? Um, Like in terms of like continuity? Yeah, or like storyline wise, yeah. No, I think it was supposed to be a, a, a totally different thing. Okay. But... I do you obviously think, knew the character better. Right, of that, right. But. And I think that, like that's another big, like I don't think we, I mean, I, I think it's positive that we would not have gotten the X-Men movie that we got if we even got any X-Men movie, if not for the series, because it made it such a household name. I, I think the, the other piece of that that I was going to say in terms of just the influence of the show, I don't think people realize necessarily, unless you're a Marvel Comics fan, that, I mean, I think the X-Men, let me fact check myself here. Uh, I think the first, yeah, the first issue came out in September 1963, which was uh, about a year after Amazing Fantasy 15 uh, release, which was the first Spider-Man appearance. Mm. So it was, it's Stan Lee and Jack Kirby back in the same era where they're creating uh, Thor and the Hulk and the Avengers. And uh, it's like in that golden era, but the X-Men for the longest time were kind of like the, uh, not like redheaded stepchild, but they, they weren't ever really the star of the show. Like okay. Spider-Man was for a long time. The Avengers were for a long time. Obviously Fantastic Four is what kicked all that off. But uh, the 
the team would also be, and that's why I say this, kind of unrecognizable to a lot of people because the original X-Men team did not have Wolverine. It did not have Storm. You didn't have Nightcrawler or Colossus. Like it was Cyclops, Iceman, uh, Jean Grey, who was Marvel Girl at the time, Angel, and Beast, but without any of the fur. Okay, okay, two questions there. Not to put you on the spot, but what is the order of the comic creations of those four main properties? What's the when did Stanley come up with Spider Man, Avengers, mm. X Men, and Fantastic Four? What was first? So Fantastic Four was ver- was the very first. That was kind of his very first idea. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. I'm, you know, he had been working in comics since he was pretty young. I actually think one of the f- fun little tidbits about Stanley is that uh, he, and, you know, Captain America was created 20 years, over 20 years before any of these other properties because obviously it was a wartime thing. Oh, and okay. he was, uh, yeah, it was like actually famously uh, the, the first issue of Captain America shows him punching Adolf Hitler on the jaw, which is where the Captain America First Avenger gag comes from. That was actually before... Uh, we had even joined the the Allied forces in World War II, so it was kind of a controversial, controversial. move. Okay. Uh, and so, so is Captain America, the first character, Stanley, on a Marvel level, like a big level, came up with. He did not come up with him, oh, uh, but okay. he did. He, I think, he gets credit for uh, just as like a assistant editor or whatever role he had as a young guy. I think he's the one that came up with the. Uh, circular shield for Captain America, which is a pretty big component. So Uh, then he goes like, really it's fantastic Four, then Spider-Man Avengers and then X-Men is after all that. It's right in there. Like it's, it's fantastic Four, And then roughly a year later, Spider-Man takes off. And I think right around that time, I I think Thor was technically maybe between fantastic four and Spider-Man. Uh, Hulk was, I think, between Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. But I think that... And then the Avengers is kind of... You know, it's it's a combination it's the, it's of existing characters. Up, yeah. uh, when he made the X-Men comic, was it intended to be in the same comic universe as the Avengers? Yes. So, like, the Avengers would be aware of those characters? Yeah, yeah. And they were... Uh, even early on, you would have guest appearances... Now, one thing that you and I have talked about that I think becomes important now as we're talking about the MCU of it all, uh, or or will be, the Marvel Universe in the 60s was still so small that it made sense. Like, the Avengers were all of the kind of superheroes that were doing more, uh, like... Galactic? Well, eventually, yeah. But also just, like, they were doing the more, like like military style missions that we can associate them with on the MCU side. Obviously they had supervillains and all that, but the X-Men were originally like, we've talked about the kind of civil rights uh, allegory, but you know, you only had a handful. And so it was a lot easier to say, well, like these are the handful that are on the Avengers. This is how they all got their powers or or the technology they use. And then this is like the Fantastic Four. They have a very specific origin story, Spider-Man. So it was a lot easier to like keep everyone defined. As the as the world grew out, I think it got a little messier. And I think the comics have struggled with the same thing we've talked about on the MCU, which is what okay, we now have so many superheroes and super people, why are the X-Men specifically so discriminated against and targeted uh, in, in ways that Captain America isn't? And they've, you know, they've, de- they've dealt with that. But that was like, that was always the intention to have them in the same, uh, in the okay. same world. Another question. Uh, you know how the live action X-Men stuff is kind of focused on Wolverine? Yes, there's a whole... yeah. There's a whole uh, cast, obviously, and they all do stuff, but Wolverine's kind of the focal point. Is that the case in the animated series? And if not him, is there one character that when you watch the whole series before X-Men 97, you kind of go like, the show's kind of about this person? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and that's kind of what I was what I was teeing up. Uh, Wolverine does not even, you know, so the, the X-Men were created in 63. Wolverine shows up in, I think, 75. Oh, wow. 12 years. Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of a crazy, uh, there aren't really many analogs to that. Uh, you know, it's like if the, I mean, I, Wolverine is one of the most famous superhero characters, period. But on the show, uh, you know, which I guess gets started roughly 15 years later, uh, they, the, the team you see is almost unrecognizable from at least the way these characters were portrayed in the sixties mm. because they were going off of this, like almost, it's not a reboot. It's all in the same continuity, but like in the seventies, the X-Men get such a, a, a facelift. Yes. Yeah. That it's like, they brought a lot of new character designs in. And like, like I said, that's where you get Storm and Colossus and Nightcrawler and most importantly, Wolverine, who does, I mean, he really was the star of that property and that property was the star of Marvel for a long time. So in the show, I would say Wolverine is definitely the character that is most memorable and gets probably the most attention. The other one I would say that maybe people should keep in mind if they're if they're just jumping onto X-Men 97 uh, Jubilee is a character that was used in the show uh, to basically be the like the the audience stand in where it's like a it's a young mutant that the X-Men save. It, it actually has a lot in common with the first X-Men film to your point where like the kind of the, the role that Rogue plays in that Rogue, first yeah. movie yeah, yeah, yeah. is kind of what Jubilee plays early on in the, in the cartoon. And so you kind of get to, you're introduced to the entire X-Men world through her. That's where we get a lot of exposition. And then we kind of watch her grow into more of a full-on team member by the end. And I think the creators of X-Men 97 have said like one of the changes now is she's she's kind of ascending to that status of like an actual team member and no longer like the okay. the kid. And I think they're moving maybe a, a new character into that role that I don't really need to talk about because I think we're going to be introduced to Sunspot within the context of that show. Wikipedia says X-Men 97 was reported to not be set within Marvel Studios' shared universe, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, since it continues the storylines of the original series, which DeMeo later confirmed, saying the series was its own thing. Within Marvel Comics Multiverse, the original series exists on Earth 92131. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a multiversal thing. Um which is worth keeping in mind because, yeah, it might be yeah. a universe that we see a glimpse of in some way. That number I just read, though, that's different than the live-action X-Men universe, too, right? Right. So that's not, like, obviously, I guess it's animated, but you wouldn't run into one of the animated characters where Monica Rambeau is right now. No, no. Uh that's the, I think if anything, they designate the X-Men cartoon as being in the same universe as like the Spider-Man cartoon and, uh, and what, well, not what if either. Cause what if is all the universes? Yeah. Right. It could be right. one of the what if stories. I mean, of. that would be like such a fun, like that, that's the kind of creative stuff that I think would be. What, that the watcher, you get a shot of the watcher yeah. watching the X-Men 97 stuff go down. Right. I mean, that would be like, a uh, unnecessary but fun shout out okay as we're about to put on a few episodes i think you and i are going to have access to a few episodes this week as i'm talking mm -hmm. um what's in in closing what's the last thing you'd want people to know like what do you want people like me and other listeners who haven't seen this to know to fully enjoy this series we talked about the impact it had in the 90s right and kind of the thought behind the creation of it. But what is something like get my mind framed correctly yeah. for this series? No, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing is just know the context here, not storyline wise. Because I, I, I have to believe the show is going to do a good job of 
of welcoming in people like you that that do not necessarily want to go back and watch five seasons of a 90s cartoon show to prep. Uh, so I think like the the context that I'm talking about is more, this is supposed to take place in 1997. It is supposed to feel like, I mean, the whole show, okay. when you go back and watch it, I mean, it, it's for us, even though there were elements of it at the time that were supposed to be futuristic, it's got sure. such a nostalgic feel because you see people using like payphones and things. And yep. that was just supposed to be like, that wasn't supposed to be a throwback. So I think knowing that like that's the context setting wise, but also like vibe wise, like that makes it's sense. it's not it is not taking itself too seriously. And it's also like on the other hand, leaning into melodrama. So it's like in some ways the X-Men comics and show kind of uh they turn into soap operas in the best way where it's like, like the whole thing that, again, this is reflected in those early X-Men films, like the love triangle with Logan and Scott and Gene, right. you know, and it's like this stuff is, that's when the X-Men property really took off in the seventies is when Chris Claremont really started adding in that, like the drama. Yeah. Yeah. It, like the, the relational drama and, that combined with like a bunch of aliens and lasers, everybody was just like, yeah, I'm in. And I think that that's kind of what you have to expect. Like it's not, it's so different from at least the roots of the MCU, which are really interested in grounding things. That is not what this show is about. This show is about like space empires and like soul suckers and like your ex-girlfriend you coming back with like massive hand claws uh because she's like wants revenge obviously it's like a, who yeah, I doesn't mean, have that problem <laughs> which i mean the thing it, it, and in that way it's relatable yeah uh, exactly and that's but, what keeps me centered in this show exactly like if nothing else you can ground uh there but i th i would say just that's when people that's i think what people need to do the most to enjoy it is know that this is supposed to give you that like Saturday morning cartoon feeling like if you're watching, you know, Ninja Turtles or whatever. And did you make it all the way through all five seasons again with some of our listeners? I did. Yeah. And, did? and well, okay. we will this, this weekend is going to be the final. Okay. Uh, I That's think cool. the final viewing, but do you feel more ready. I definitely do. It's also been fun because we've been trying to, recreate, you know, doing the Saturday morning watches and putting it in that context, I think has made it a lot more fun than just trying to like binge through it as quickly as possible. Okay. I I'm think still, what we'll do, Rob, is let's you and I watch episodes one, two, three, four, whatever. And then if it's clearly picking up from 96 and something that like, feel free to inform me if there's something that I should be knowing if I had watched the others, you know, whatever. There'll yeah. be some stuff, even if it's just an Easter egg. You could be like, oh, and that's kind of a callback to 1994 when this happened or whatever. So yeah. feel free to do that stuff as we go along. Well, and that's what I think. That's why I'm glad you haven't seen it, because I, I think that that'll be a good reminder. I, I do think, and this is a bit of a spoiler for people that don't, I don't know that I haven't seen the series, but also at this point, if you're going to watch live, I I don't think that you have time to make it through all seasons. Sure. Uh, I say that some of our listeners. Yeah. Are oh, you've done it. You could do it. I believe. In well, you. but I just mean like <laughs> in the next, like in the next week, but yeah, yeah. that's true. I probably, I yeah. probably could. Um, but I, I will say the, the series ends giving the impression that professor X is uh, gone. Maybe like I, I, I'll I'll leave it there. Like through the entire season or, or series, Xavier has been the team leader. If you've seen the trailer for X Men ninety seven, I think you, you know, it, it's maybe not that much of a spoiler. He is no longer leading the team. That's kind of where it's picking up, and I think that that's kind of the the big question of like, what does the X Men look like without? Xavier and we see like Cyclops moving into more of a leadership role, but I think we also see Magneto kind of moving oh, in 
to an Xavier type role. So I what? think it's a really different setup. That, what the uh, hell's going on here? <laughs> Michael Scott style. I think uh, I think it's important for people to understand that. That's like maybe the one big plot thing just to set the table that uh, that's not like a, we're not in some weird universe where Professor X is not there. We're just in a maybe post Xavier moment within that universe. Amazing. I'm excited to have new content. Uh, for our listeners out there, give us a little bit of time to kind of feel out the rhythm of this all. You and I are going to watch a few and see what this kind of goes and feels like. Uh, there might be some room for us to talk about other things every week in conjunction with X-Men 97 and whatnot, depending on how it goes and yeah. what the weekly release is like and stuff. So, Well, what I'm, I'm so excited for you to watch this while we're going through our, our movie rewatch, because yeah, right. I I think the show is generally seen as very, very comic accurate. Okay. And they the, the seasons that exist are kind of like abbreviated versions of like, you know, a decade or two of X-Men comics. So for okay. you, it's actually going to be a great, like that will be a great primer so that you kind of understand who characters are more or less in the comics. And so then whenever you see like like Gambit show up in X-Men Origins Wolverine, you understand like what the comic version of that character looks like. Sure. Or like the blob, you know, and what the comic version of that character looks like versus Which I don't know. Uh so yeah, I think that like it, it I think it's gonna make for some really fun conversations and really mm. link up with the the reviews we're doing on the the Patreon side. And we can't say who yet, but you and I are maybe going to have a chance to talk to a few of the creators of this show or actors from this show, Yeah, which could be a really fun tie-in with a specific episode. You know, if we did a few of them and, hey, we're talking about episode four today, but also hear from so-and-so on their experience with episode four, which could be a really yeah. fun way to go about it too. So uh, if you subscribe to Friends from Work Plus, which you can find on our website or Discord or whatever, last Thursday we released X2, United, which is an absolute banger of an episode. And then the way we're rewatching it and a movie is every two weeks we're doing another one. So not this week, Thursday, but the following Thursday, we're going to be doing X-Men first class. So we kind of took mm -hmm. a step backwards in the timeline. We explain why over there. So even if you're not a subscriber, you can be rewatching at the same pace if you want to uh, those films with us. And then mm -hmm. hop on Discord or wherever, send us an email and chat about it, which we love to hear from people. Uh, and so just on that front, it's X-Men First Class. And then we're going to do X-Men Wolverine Origins or Origins Wolverine. Yeah. That's where we're at there. So if that sounds interesting to you, check out Friends from Work Plus. But over here on the main feed, mainly talking about X-Men 97, which releases officially, I think it's going to be on Wednesdays, is my belief, with the first two episodes releasing the first night. Um, which I'm okay with our episodes are still going to stay on Mondays. So you have some time to watch the show over the weekend, digest it. And then we'll be breaking it down every Monday, which I will. I, I like that the episodes are coming out on Monday. I'm sure that we will watch them, uh, more or less when they, when they come out, but I would encourage people. It's been so fun doing our Saturday morning viewings of the oh, series yeah. that we've been rewatching. Keep it on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was kind of bummed that they didn't, uh, take yeah. the opportunity to follow up on that that time slot. Good point. And so I like that. Uh, you know, people can in they the same the way ball, that we they put the ball in your court. It's it, the power's in your hands now. You can exactly. watch on Saturday morning if you want. Yeah. To. So I would encourage people, especially if you have kids. I think that would be a really fun uh, little little tradition to start. And maybe then you can, if you haven't watched the old stuff, once this season's over, it'll give you something to go back and enjoy. Here we go. Let's go. New content. I'm coming in with an open heart, humble mind, humble spirit. Let's find out what X-Men 97 is all about. Thank you for listening to Friends from Work, and we'll see you right back here next week talking about that here on Friends from Work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, speaking of, as the outro music is playing, Laura Cartman uh, at the Oscars <laughs> was fun to see. Giving Incredible. us a little, little X-Men music. <laughs>